This video is about rotifers. Most rotifers are tiny, free-living organisms like these brachionis swimming around, but a large group of rotifers, the acanthocephalans, are much bigger animals that live as parasites in the intestines of vertebrates. Here's a phylogeny of the rotifers. We'll consider three groups, deloids and acanthocephalans, which are sister taxa, and their sister taxon, the monogonons. We'll start with the monogonons with Brachionis, which I got from Cabrillo Aquarium, where they're reared as food for larval fishes. You can see from the ruler on the right, whose smallest subdivisions are millimeters, that they're pretty small. These are adults. At higher magnification, you can see that some individuals are carrying a sphere on their posterior end. Each of those spheres is a developing embryo. The green internal structures are compartments of the gut filled with green algae that they captured from suspension. Here are three adults pinned under a cover slip. You can see that they can pull both the anterior corona and the posterior foot into the larica. This clip gives you a good sense of the digestive system. I can't see the mouth, but it's on the far left in the middle of the ciliary bands of the corona. Just posterior to it is the muscular pharynx, the mastax, which contains some hard jaw structures called trophi. That is connected to the stomach, the first green compartment, by a narrow esophagus you'll see better later. Second green compartment is the intestine, which leads to the anus at the base of the foot. Right above the intestine is a clear sac. That's the bladder, which you can see empty out once in a while. The bladder just emptied out, and now it will start to refill. This animal is compressed a little to show the mastax a little more clearly. The red spot you see is the ocellus on the dorsal side of the body, right on the cerebral ganglion. To see the trophy of the mastax more clearly, you need to get rid of some of the muscles around it. I added a little bleach to this specimen to dissolve away some of that tissue, and I compressed it to spread out the trophy a little bit. Anterior is down, as you can see by the position of the ocellus. In this individual, the mastax and the stomach are separated by a bit of space, so you can see the esophagus connecting those two compartments.
and from this animal's behavior you can infer the position of the anus. While we're talking about getting rid of things, here's some more bladder action. On this animal, the bladder is below the intestine. Watch it carefully. It will expel urine, then refill, then do it again. Urine is expelled in an opening shared with the anus, the cloaca. The bladder is refilling as the proto-nephridial terminal cells filter fluid from the pseudoseal. You can see the flagelli in a terminal cell beating towards the top of this view, which is the animal's right side. They look like a rapidly moving sine wave. Those are flagelli in one terminal cell, but there are multiple terminal cells in this animal. Here's another one towards the posterior end. The flagelli in this terminal cell are moving more slowly. Here's a terminal cell at higher magnification. You can see those flagelli beating very clearly. As we saw before, some brachionis are carrying embryos, but some aren't. The smaller ones tend not to be carrying embryos. Some adults are carrying an empty eggshell where their last juvenile hatched out. Here's a female with an early stage embryo. It doesn't have an ocellus yet or a corona. The female has two V-shaped structures that look like they connect the stomach to the larica. Those are yolk glands that provide material to put in the egg. This female is carrying a later stage embryo, really a young juvenile. It has an ocellus and a corona. And this female is carrying an early embryo as well as the eggshell of the juvenile that recently hatched. Brachionis was from an aquarium culture, but rotifers are abundant in the wild too. I did a plankton tow from a dock in Alameda Bay to catch thousands of individuals of this rotifer, a species of Cinchita. They're often very common members of the marine plankton here in Southern California.
I think that the four brown dots inside the body are part of the stomach, but I'm not completely sure about that. You can see that Sinkita have at least four long spikes sticking out the anterior end. These are called CD or palps. I assume that they're sensory. I don't know exactly what they're used for though, feeding maybe, or detecting approaching predators. This individual is in side view. The flat organ ventral to the stomach is the ovary and the yolk gland, which together are called the germovitellarium. Here's that same individual flattened under the cover slip so it can't move. Synchita is pretty similar to Brachionis in lots of ways, but here is a pretty different monogonot rotifer, Esplankna. This species does not have a foot, and it also doesn't have a complete gut. The mouth leads to the pharynx, esophagus, and stomach, but the stomach then dead ends. The corona is the red stained ring to the left. Behind it you see two dark salivary glands attached to the anterior end of the stomach. Behind the stomach, you see a roughly V-shaped germovitellarium and a large embryo in the parent's pseudocele. The wings on the left and right of the body are just the shape of the larica. Here's another individual with a much more developed offspring in its pseudocele. The offspring is so well developed that you can see she has her own germovitellarium already. If this weren't a prepared slide, she would escape from her mother by squeezing out of a pore posteriorly. Now deloids. Deloids often live in moss, and if you collect the moss during the summer when it's dry, they've entered an anhydrobiotic state. Basically, they've lost most of their body water and are in a resting state. We don't have great moss here in Long Beach, so I asked my father to send me some from Sonoma County. He sent me a lot of moss. All I did to see deloids was to soak some of the moss in fresh water for about a half hour, shake it out, then look at the particles left behind in the dish. Here's what I found on the bottom of the dish. Lots and lots of anhydrobiotic rotifers. You can see five in this view. I filmed these 10 individuals for about one and a half hours to see if any would rehydrate and start crawling around. I got most of the way there. Here's that footage compressed into a bit less than a minute. Here's a rehydrated deloid on the bottom of the dish. She is holding onto a particle with her toes. Here's another individual showing off her nice corona and mastax.
When this individual is in side view, you can see a short dorsal antenna at the anterior end. I believe it's a sensory structure. Here's a compressed individual to show internal anatomy. The mastax of this deloid has some complicated trophy. Further posterior, I think those two ovoid structures are germovitellarium, but I'm not totally sure of that. I should have fed these animals some colored particles so I could mark the digestive system. Just anterior to the foot, you can see the bladder contracting to expel urine, then refilling and doing it again. The pseudoceal is full of tiny cells, which you can see sloshing around as the rotifer moves its foot. The bladder is filling because of the action of protonephridia, like in other rotifers. You can see those most clearly up near the head. I see about five terminal cells in this view. And now for something completely different. All the rotifers we've looked at so far are tiny and free-living, but one clade of rotifers, Acanthocephala, is composed of large-bodied animals that as adults are obligate parasites of the intestines of vertebrates, where they act like tapeworms. They don't have a mouth or digestive system, they just absorb host food across their epidermis. One of these species, Prophylicolis altmani, is very common in Southern California. Adults live in gulls or other marine birds, but there's another stage, the cysticanth larva, that uses an easily collected intermediate host, the sand crab Emerita analoga. Most large sand crabs in Southern California are infected with Prophylicolis. The cysticanths live in the digestive gland, and you can find them easily by dissecting a sand crab. I froze this animal before dissecting it. The white football-shaped object is the cysticanth larva. Large sand crabs sometimes have 10 or 12 of these in their digestive glands. This individual had three. This cysticanth is still enveloped in some host tissue. If you look at it at higher magnification, you can see that one end is inverted. When the sand crab is eaten by a final host bird, that part everts and grabs onto the bird's intestine where it lives the rest of its life. You can force these to evert by incubating them in fresh water. 
This took about an hour, which I've sped up to about a minute for this video. Let's follow this cysticanth on the right more closely. The last thing that pops out is the spiny head that gives this clade its name. Acantho means spiny and cephala means head. So these are spiny headed worms. They dig that spiny head or proboscis into the intestinal tissue of their final host to hang on. You can imagine that the recurved hooks on that proboscis might be useful for holding on to the intestinal wall of your final host.